Good evening, everyone. If you can find your way to your seats. My name is Jelani Cobb, and I am the Dean of Columbia Journalism School. Oh, thank you. And I get uh, the wonderful task of officially welcoming you to the 84th annual Mariah Moore's Cabot Prize Ceremony, the oldest awards in international journalism. And we are here after a two-year pandemic hiatus. We're back in the rotunda at Low Library, uh, so we are particularly pleased to see all of you here this evening. I'm so glad we can all be together in person to honor outstanding journalism in and about Latin America. This night, celebrating the Cabot Prizes is always special, but this year it is going to be extra special. Tonight, we're going to honor journalists with the 2022 prizes who have dedicated their careers to understanding and reporting on sometimes underreported yet key parts of our hemisphere and our world, from Mexico to Chile, the United States, and beyond. Welcome to this year's honorees. And we have some special guests. A group of Cabot winners from 2021 and 2020 are here with us tonight. During the two long years of the worst, the worst of the pandemic, we honored these reporters virtually. Tonight, we will honor them IRL, as the young people say. So welcome to the 2020 and 2021 Cabot medalists and citation winners. You can, you can, you can. And we're also very fortunate to have the president of Columbia University, Lee C. Bollinger, the longtime master of ceremonies of these proceedings, with us for one last time in the course of his long and storied career. Welcome to President Bollinger. Now, I'd like to acknowledge some of the people who make this event possible. First, I'd like to welcome members of the Cabot family. Your leadership and continued support enables us to pay tribute to the best reporting about the Americas. Next, I would like to welcome members of the Cabot jury, a renowned group of journalists and professors who contribute their expertise to choose our winners every year. We appreciate your many contributions to these awards. And I welcome back all past Cabot winners who are here with a special welcome and congratulations to Angela Cochega and, and Alfredo Cochado, both Cabot winners. Uh, who are also newlyweds. <laughs> this is as good a time as any uh, to announce that we are also launching the Cabot dating app, <laughs> which uh, we'll give you instructions on how to download later this evening. Uh, journalism can bring people together, uh, and it's the magic of the Cabot Prizes. I would also like to acknowledge our journalism school students in attendance, especially international students, uh, the four Cabot scholars who hail from Brazil, 
Guatemala, India, and the Philippines. If you can stand. I hope you can take time to speak to our students tonight. Uh, they are seated throughout the room. Uh, and that's it for me. Uh, please enjoy your, your dinner. We'll be, and we will be back after dinner with the prizes. All right, enjoy. We are truly honored to have so many courageous journalists here with us tonight. The challenges facing re reporters today are clear. Freedom of the press is under attack with impunity throughout the Americas and around the world. What is the appropriate response to these pressures? Why practice journalism? Tonight, we will see why. Journalism is crucial. It is more crucial now than it has ever been. <clears throat> it's critical to democracies everywhere. All of the Cabot honorees in this room attest to that. Accountability has never been more important, like reporting by Daniel Matamala and Iyan Grio. Giving voice to the underrepresented matters like Laura Castellano and doing it in new ways like my colleague Daniel Alarcon. I, I, I saw Daniel on campus earlier today and I, I teased him about getting a fresh haircut for these ceremonies. <clears throat> Now it's my privilege to introduce our first speaker, the chair of the Cabot jury, tasked with selecting our medalists each year, Rosenthal Alves. He comes to us from the University of Texas in Austin, where he holds the Knight Chair in International Journalism and researches international reporting journalism, and journalism in Latin America especially the struggle for free press in the hemisphere and online journalism. In 1996, he moved from Austin, moved to Austin from Rio de Janeiro, where he was the managing editor and a member of the board of the directors of the Journal de Brazil, one of Brazil's most important newspapers. For more than a decade, he was a foreign correspondent based in Spain, Argentina, Mexico, and the United States. And he himself was honored with a Cabot Prize in 2016. Please join me in welcoming Rosenthal Alves. Thank you so much, Jelani. It's so Wonderful to be here again. Uh, it's even moving. Good evening, everyone. It is truly an honor to par participate in these proceedings here at Columbia again. To all the, on the honorees here tonight, welcome. To my fellow judges, thank you for your hard work selecting this outstanding group of winners. To the journalism school, and Abby Wright, who runs this award with her team, thank you for all your work organizing this beautiful event. Thank you, Abby. <laughs> President Bollinger, I bring a, spe a special message for you from the Cabot jury. We would like to thank you for your steadfast support for the prizes during your 20-year-long tenure leading Columbia University. You have shown a deep understanding of the importance of the Cabot Prizes, which honor journalists reporting on Latin America who often work under adverse, repressive, 
and even mortally dangerous conditions. The awards lift up reporting from a region that is undercovered in the United States and yet is fundamental to progress and, sec to progress and security in this hemisphere. In your remarks at our annual ceremonies year after year, and in the interest you've shown in the prizes, you've reinforced the idea that probing journalism and broad press freedoms are essential to the advance of democracy in the Americas. We are especially grateful for your personal engagement with the awards and your words to let the prize winners know if year after year how you have been moved and inspired by their accomplishments. In an age of changing technology and misinformation, the Cabot Awards continue to have a significant impact in the region, rewarding journalists across different media who have an enduring commitment to fact-finding, accountability, and truth. In 1938, the Cabot Prizes found their best home at Columbia. We are thankful that, as president, you reconfirmed, reaffirmed, that they are part of the essential mission of a forward-thinking university that looks outward to the world. Please welcome president, the president of Columbia University, Lee C. Bollinger. And I have, a, I have a little surprise for you here. President Bollinger, please accept this special award from the, the Cabot in honor of all your accomplishment for the Cabot Prize. Thank you. It is a little heavy. It is, it is heavy, but it's come from our heart. So Thank you. you. Really, really, really. And I can put it uh, here for you. Thanks so Thank you very, very much for that. It means uh, an enormous amount to me, and uh, I want you to know that. I would like to acknowledge the Cabot family, who, as pointed out, endowed this prize in 1938. I also want to thank and recognize the Cabot board, who always work incredibly diligently to select the winners. And I'd like to acknowledge Jelani Cobb, who's making his first Cabot Award as Dean of the Journalism School. And uh, we're very fortunate to have Jelani in this role. Uh, he comes after two remarkable deans uh, before, Stephen Cole and Nick Lemon, and uh, Jelani will be uh, just fantastic. So, um, I just have really two points before uh, turning this over to um, the awardees. Uh, the first is to uh, recognize Columbia. And in particular, I, I want to stress just how committed uh, this institution is to supporting press freedom and freedom of speech uh, in the world. And it's I believe the single most, uh, the, the institution has the single most dedication to this. And of course it starts with the journalism school and with prizes like this and courses and students, degrees, and many, many activities. I mean the journalism school is a gem. It leads every other journalism school uh, in the world. But we have other schools that have experts in this. You know my own uh, expertise is in the First Amendment and freedom of the press and so on. Uh, and I think I began as a journalist long before anybody in this room. I was the janitor of my father's daily newspaper in a rural town in Oregon when I was uh, 12 years old. So I 
took the lead, you know, the pigs, as they were called, melted them down uh, at night, and they were reattached to the linotype. And in some way, the newspaper was produced. I developed the films. Um, so I started with a very, very uh, basic kind of understanding of journalism in a small town. Uh, and it became my field, and universities became my world. And I think universities are just akin to journalism, both when they're at their best. The law school has experts. The School of International and Public Affairs has experts. The engineering school now has experts on uh, freedom of expression and press and, and so on. So all across the institution, in schools and, and colleges, we have people uh, who focus on this, as many or more than any other institution. But to that, we have also added the Knight Institute on the First Amendment, which is a university created uh, entity with the Knight Foundation to uh, both uh, do research and uh, public policy outreach and litigate um, on behalf of the First Amendment. We also have Columbia Global Freedom of Expression, uh, which I set up, which focuses on uh, free expression all across the world, now led by Catalina Botero. Uh, from Colombia, and before that by Anya's Calamard, uh, who was outstanding. And we have Columbia Global Reports, and we have uh, this and that. If you add it all together, uh, Columbia University is not only a natural home for the Cabot Awards, uh, it is part and parcel of an extraordinary range of activities in support of freedom of the press. And the second thing I want to say is simply uh, how admiring I am of the people who win these awards and the people who support them and the colleagues of those. Every single year I am here because of that, because these are incredibly special people, enormously brave, courageous, representing the very best of the field of journalism. So let's turn to the awards. So in addition to this year's gold medals for lifetime achievement, during tonight's ceremony, we will celebrate some of the winners from the past two years who are with us. I'd like to invite our first Cabot Gold medalist, Daniel Alarcon, to the podium. Daniel is a journalist, radio producer, and novelist who has spent his career telling the stories of the Americas in English and Spanish in print and audio, in fiction and nonfiction. Born in Lima, Peru, and raised in Birmingham, Alabama, Daniel began his career writing fiction. His 2007 novel, Lost City Radio, was a finalist for the Penn Faulkner Prize. As a print journalist, Daniel now covers the region for The New Yorker, publishing deeply reported pieces about political corruption in Peru, social unrest in Chile, or the aftermath of the world's most virulent outbreak of COVID-19 in Ecuador. He is an assistant professor here at the Columbia Journalism School. In 2011, together with his wife, Carolina Guerrero, <laughs> Daniel founded the groundbreaking narrative journalism podcast, Radio Ambulante. In just over a decade, this has revolutionized the audio journalism landscape in Latin America, publishing more than 300 episodes from more than 20 countries, telling the stories of love and family, migration and money, 
Youth Culture and Politics. In 2016, Radio Ambulante joined NPR and remains its only Spanish language podcast. In 2021, In 2021, Daniel's work earned him a MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant. For all of these innovations in storytelling and for fostering a broad community of listeners, we are proud to award Daniel Alarcón with the Mariah Moores Cabot Gold Medal. Congratulations, Daniel. Hi, everybody. This is amazing. Um, I've prepared something. Um, I'd like to say thank you uh, to the board of the Maria Moores Cabot Prize for this incredible honor. To my colleagues at NPR who nominated me, thank you very much. I'm, of course, very grateful to the trustees of Columbia University for offering me this award, to President Bollinger and uh, my colleague, Dean Cobb. Um, I'd like to thank my wife, Carolina. <clears throat> who is in every way, personally and professionally, a partner in all that I do. It goes without saying that I wouldn't be here on this stage accepting this award without her love and support. The most beautiful sound in the world is Carolina's laughter. And I'm the lucky man who gets to hear it most. Thank you. It also means a great deal to have my sons, Leon and Eliseo, here tonight. I hope they know how much they inspire me each day. I also want to thank my parents, Renato and Graciela, who traveled across the country to be here. They taught me, through their quiet and determined example, everything I ever needed to know about hard work and a commitment to excellence. And also, this is an aside, and I'm sure she won't want me to share, but it's my mother's birthday on Thursday, and so this award, of course, is for her. Feliz cumpleaños. So when I published my first collection of stories in 2005, I got many very nice and even many more very strange emails, including ones of this variety. An American reader would congratulate me on my book on my lovely sentences and powerful imagery, and would then quickly shift to the real point of the message, which was to ask if I could recommend a good hotel in Cusco. <laughs> I'd sit with these messages for a moment and wonder to myself if this kind of thing happened to all writers, to white writers. And then, because I was raised to have good manners, well, I would look up hotels in Cusco <laughs> and send a very polite email back. I see myself now as I saw myself then, someone placed in the fortunate position of interlocutor between languages, between cultures, increasingly between media as I try along with my talented team at Radio Ambulante to create something beautiful and meaningful and human week after week. Latin American stories in sound that live between journalism and literature and entertainment. I was born in Lima, Peru and raised in Birmingham, Alabama. I mention this because Alabama is, in some ways, a fairly exotic place to grow up if one is to go on and write about Latin America, to cover the region well, and to tell its stories. But this is what growing up in the Deep South did for me. I never took my heritage for granted. I wasn't allowed to. I could regale you with the many ways my last name was mispronounced or mangled by well-meaning and sometimes not so well-meaning neighbors and peers or describe the times I was asked when I was a kid 
where exactly in Mexico Peru was located. <laughs> Growing up in a Peruvian household in Alabama in the 1980s teaches you the value of patience. My nickname on my neighborhood soccer team growing up was simply Peru, tossed at me with derision, but a name I came to be very proud of. Anything in any way to be identified with the country where I was born, where my family came from, where our story began, was important to me then and is important to me now. I'm a journalist because I wanted to know more about that place because I wanted to interrogate those origins, excuse me. I knew I didn't fit in where I was, and I wondered if there was another place where I might. I wondered if that place was Peru. My childhood is filled with stories of car bombs and kidnappings and chaos happening in the country where I was born, but not where I was growing up. It was both thousands of miles away and an integral part of our daily lives. I wanted to understand, I wanted to know, I wanted to imagine what my life might have been like if we'd never left. Those questions led me to other questions. And if there's anything that I have, any advantage or special trait or talent I possess, it's really just curiosity. I want to hear people talk. I want to know their stories because I know they have something to teach me. It's such an honor and in some ways still a great surprise that I've been able to build a life around the simple act of listening, a career of it. I really can't believe my good fortune to have the family that I have the wife and children that I have, the parents I have, the sisters I have, the friends who love me, the colleagues who push me. It's unfathomable, really. It isn't often one gets to say these things publicly, but it's something I think about every day, how grateful I am, grateful to every person who told me their story when they didn't have to, to every friend who read a draft or heard a mix, to every teacher who challenged me, to the ones who consoled me when I was lost, who told me it would get better if I worked hard, if I believed in myself. And they were right. And so this prize is theirs, too. Thank you. Laura Casarellos, please come to the podium. Over the course of her 30-year career, our second cabinet medalist has become one of Mexico's leading independent reporters, producing consistently excellent work that demonstrates her commitment to the truth and her talent for in-depth reporting. A tireless journalist, feminist, and author of six books, Laura is widely respected for her revelatory investigations that have uncovered uncomfortable truths, including stories about the extrajudicial killings by security forces in 2015 and elsewhere. She does this challenging work as a freelancer for Mexican and US publications, documenting the underrepresented and holding leaders accountable at her own risk. Over her career, Laura has developed a new journalistic narrative that addresses issues of structural violence, keeping issues of gender, class, and ethnicity in the forefront. She is the co-founder of Reporters and Guardia, a collective of roughly 100 female reporters who are building a digital memorial featuring profiles of journalists murdered in Mexico. Mexico is considered to be the most dangerous country in the world for journalists. As an example of a courageous reporter who, pers who perseveres and even excels in the face of adversity, the jury is proud to present Laura Castellanos 
with the Mariah Moores Cabot Gold Medal. Congratulations, Laura. I'm going to read in Spanish. I don't know if it's Cucha. In my país, Mexico, matar a periodistas es como matar a nadie. In my country, Mexico, killing journalists is like killing a nobody. El 98% de los asesinatos y el 100% de las desapariciones de periodistas están en la impunidad. 98% of journalists' murders and 100% of the disappearances of journalists go unpunished. Desde el 2000, en México han asesinado a 156 periodistas y desaparecido a 29. Del total de víctimas, 26 son mujeres. Since the year 2000, 156 journalists have been murdered in Mexico. 29 have been disappeared, of whom 26 are women. Estas cifras proceden de conteos realizados por organizaciones civiles. Reporteros sin fronteras considera a México como el país más peligroso del mundo para ejercer nuestro oficio. These are figures by civil civil organizations and Reporters Without Borders considers Mexico the most dangerous uh, country to practice journalism in the world. La espiral ascendente de violencia contra nuestro gremio es una consecuencia de la estrategia de seguridad militarizada que inició hace 15 años el entonces presidente Felipe Calderón. Sus sucesores, Enrique Peña Nieto y Andrés Manuel López Obrador, la han profundizado. The upward spiral of violence against Mexican journalism resulted from a militarized security strategy that was started 15 years ago by then President Felipe Calderón. His successors, Enrique Peña Nieto and Andrés Manuel López Obrador, have only deepened it. Me genera impotencia, rabia y dolor ver cómo aumenta la magnitud de la tragedia. En estos 15 años, en mi país han asesinado a más de 350 mil personas y desaparecido a más de 88 mil. Witnessing this tragedy's worsening has only made me feel helpless, angry, and deep pain. In these 15 years, more than 350,000 people have been murdered in Mexico. More than 88,000 have been disappeared. Ante esta situación, en 2018 fundé la colectiva independiente Reporteras en Guardia. Somos hoy una red de más de 100 mujeres periodistas, la mayoría freelance, del interior de México. Juntas estamos construyendo el memorial digital Matar a Nadie. Escribimos las historias de las víctimas de nuestro gremio. Lo hacemos por mera voluntad de conjurar el olvido y la exigencia de justicia. En 2018, I founded the independent collective Reporteras en Guardia, women reporters on duty and on guard, to deal with this situation. Today, we are more than 100 women journalists, mostly from the interior of Mexico, and we write the stories of journalists who are victims for a digital memorial called Matar a Nadie, to kill a nobody. We do this from the absolute conviction that we must stand up and avoid oblivion and find justice. Al investigar estas historias, documentamos también las terribles condiciones en las que se ejerce el periodismo en México. Se trabaja generalmente de forma precaria, bajo riesgo, sin beneficios laborales, haciendo otros oficios. By investigating these stories, we also document the terrible conditions in which journalism is practiced in Mexico. Our journalists work in precarious situations, mostly without benefits and with the need to have other employment. 
Desde que era una estudiante universitaria, me forjé bajo un principio. El periodismo debe ser una herramienta de transformación social. The principle that followed me since my days as a university student was that journalism should be a tool for social transformation. Comencé mi carrera en el suplemento feminista del diario La Jornada que dirigía la periodista Sara Lovera. En esos años, la tesis de Rosa Rojas, otra colega, me marcó. El periodismo objetivo no existe. El subjetivo y ético sí. I began my career in the feminist supplement of the newspaper La Jornada, then directed by the journalist Sara Llovera. And in those years, the thesis of another colleague, Rosa Rojas, shaped me. She would say, objective journalism does not exist. Subjective and ethical journalism does. Y yo, subjetivamente, decidí recoger las voces invisibilizadas en los grandes medios. Desde entonces, me propuse hacer un periodismo que revela la violencia estructural por razones de género, clase y racismo. And I subjectively decided and I subjectively decided to collect the voices that were being made invisible by the mainstream media. Since then, I practiced journalism that reveals what the structural violence is on questions of gender, class, and racism. Mi desafío ha sido registrar el desgarramiento social de mi país bajo la estrategia de seguridad militarizada. Mi trabajo no hace eco de la narrativa oficial que excluye la responsabilidad del Estado en la violencia y culpa solo a las mafias criminales. My challenge has been registering the social tearing apart of my country under this militarized strategy of security. My work does not echo the official narrative which excludes any responsibility for the state of the, for this violence and only blames it on the criminal mafia. Desafortunadamente, pienso que en los años que vienen, el gremio mexicano contará más historias de violencia y dolor. El actual presidente López Obrador está profundizando la militarización del país. Ha convertido al ejército en una potencia económica sin candados de fiscalización. Les ha dado el control de la seguridad pública, la construcción de megaproyectos y ha legalizado su presencia en las calles hasta 2028. Todo esto es la crónica de una hecatombe anunciada. Unfortunately. I believe we will tell many more stories of violence and pain in the years to come. The current President, López Obrador, is only deepening the country's militarization. The country has turned the army into an economic power without controls, and the President has set public security under the control of the military, asking the army to build huge mega-projects and legalizing its presence on the streets of our country until the year 2028. This is, in fact, the chronicle of a catastrophe, catastrophe foretold. López Obrador confronta al periodismo crítico a través de la descalificación y la estigmatización. Es omiso ante la impunidad de las desapariciones y asesinatos de colegas durante su mandato. Ha recortado los fondos para proteger a periodistas y activistas bajo amenaza. López Obrador confronts critical journalism by stigmatizing and disqualifying this work. He's ignored the impunity of disappearances and the murders of colleagues during his mandate and cut funding to offer protection to journalism to journalists and activists who are under threat. En este contexto desalentador, apuesto por las nuevas generaciones y las mujeres periodistas. Por eso El María Mors Cabot no se trata solo de mí. Las reporteras mexicanas han estado en la primera línea de cobertura y han revelado los casos más graves de violaciones de derechos humanos y corrupción durante la actual crisis humanitaria. Las reconozco y las abrazo. In this discouraging context, my bet is on new generations and women journalists. That's why this Maria Moore's Cabot Prize is not just about me. 
Mexican women reporters have been on the front lines of coverage and have revealed the most severe cases of human rights violations and corruption during the current humanitarian crisis. My recognition and my embrace is for them. A mis compañeras de reporteras en guardia, a mis entrañables colegas, amistades queridas y a mi familia, les agradezco su cariño cuando mi labor me ha puesto en situaciones de vulnerabilidad física y emocional. To my teammates, reporteras en guardia, to my dear colleagues and to my family, thank you for your love when I myself, due to my work, have been physically and emotionally under great vulnerability. Hace 11 años, el periodista Javier Valdés dijo aquí en Nueva York que un premio internacional como este es un faro al otro lado de la tormenta y una bahía segura más allá de la tempestad. Hoy, cinco años después de que Javier fue brutalmente asesinado en México, les digo, los abrazos colectivos y el reconocimiento a nuestro trabajo siguen siendo uno de los pocos alicientes para navegar en la tormenta. Eleven years ago, <laughs> eleven years ago, journalist Javier Valdez said here in New York that an international award and a prize like this was like a lighthouse on the other side of the storm, a safe harbor beyond the tempest. Today, five years after Javier's brutal murder in Mexico, I say that it is the collective embrace and the recognition of our work that is still one of the few incentives to weather the storm. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Now let's please take a moment to celebrate the 2020 Cabot Prize medalists. We were unable to be together two years ago in person to mark their achievements due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and instead bestowed their Cabot medals virtually. But we are fortunate that tonight some of them are here in this room with us. In this short video, we will learn about these remarkable honorees. Ricardo Calderon, he has done some of the most courageous and most important and most indispensable journalism in Colombia, I would say. He has dared to cover stories that nobody else, nobody else has dared to cover. Stories about military intelligence, he was shot because of that. He, many, many times he's been under threat, his family, uh, his colleagues in Samana, and he continues, he just continues. She has been in, in the aftermath of 9-11 in New York City. She has been in Africa covering Ebola, in hospitals in Brazil covering the intensive care sections of, of hospitals taking care of COVID-19 patients. So it's a, it's a whole body of work, but that connects with some, sometimes with this kind of hardship. Stephen Ferry is really, if I can dare say so, a poet of violence who can show you the most horrific scenes and uncover the most horrific scenes. And so his photographs create this mixture of emotion of anger and fury and sadness and a sense that because these photographs exist, justice may be done. He gives us the story without the words through some of the most searing images, but also some of the images that give you a sense of who these people are and what a loss it is not to have them. Carrie Kahn, 
is a magnificent radio reporter who has used her base at National Public Radio to humanize and make accessible stories from Haiti, from Mexico, that brought the voices and the sounds in a way that one could understand that tragedy. She captures the voices, she captures the stories, and she gets them out there to the general public. So, would Carrie Kahn and Patricia Campos Mello please come to the podium for a round of applause? And now we'll meet more of this year's winners. Johan Grillo, please come to the podium. In 2000, Johan moved from England to Mexico and intended to work as a foreign correspondent in Latin America, covering guerrilla warfare and other conflicts that have so often affected the region. Grillo ended up covering another kind of conflict, the so-called war on drugs. It has caused thousands of death, deaths, including the assassination of dozens of journalists in recent years. As a staff writer or freelance contributor to several prestigious American and European news outlets, Grillo published more than 1,000 stories from Mexico and other Latin American countries over the past two decades. He also moved beyond day-to-day -day coverage, taking on in-depth investigative reporting from the front lines and long-form narratives, including books. In 2021, he published his third book, Blood, Gun, Money, How America Arms Gangs and Cartels, after a four-year-long investigation. He came to the United States to track, as he said in a New York Times article, quote, this so-called Iron River of Guns in an effort to understand why the United States and Mexico have so badly failed to stop it. <clears throat> Grillo has also been investigating the relentless attacks on Mexican journalists, including the assassination of his friend Cabot Prize honoree Javier, Javier Valdez in 2017 for his courage and tenacity. The Mariah Moore's Cabot jury is proud to honor Johan Grillo with the Mariah Moore's Cabot Gold Medal. Congratulations, Johan. Thank you so much. I think the reason this award means so much to all of the people who win this is that it shows a recognition, a fulfillment of our life journey in journalism that we put everything into. My own journey in journalism began in the year 2000 when I arrived in Mexico City 
with a backpack and a one-way ticket. And I had a dream of being a journalist like the ones I had seen covering the civil wars of Central America, running with the Che Guevara-inspired guerrillas against the military dictatorships. But I found that era had finished. <laughs> I arrived the day before the former Coca-Cola executive, Vicente Fox, took office in Mexico, ending 71 years of one-party rule, presidential rule. And Mexico had its own dream of democracy and prosperity and human rights. And if you can cast your mind back to that year 2000, perhaps with some nostalgia, that was an era when this was the global hope, the end of history, democracy, and human rights everywhere. So I reported on this moment in Mexico, getting a job with the Houston Chronicle, and soon I got sent to cover a drug turf war in the border city of Nuevo Laredo, over the border from Laredo, Texas. We thought it was more of the same gang violence, but there were corpses turning up. And there was an old school newspaper battle among the Texas newspapers to find out what was going on. In those days, we didn't have security protocols. I would just fly up to Monterrey, rent a car, drive to the border, and hang out in the city by myself. And I found a way in by making friends with some of the drug users and drug addicts in the city. I had some experience of that because I grew up in the UK in the 80s around a lot of drugs. A heroin epidemic back then and four of my friends dying of heroin overdoses. It's crucial to cover these links between communities that consume drugs, like the one that I grew up in, and the places that produce and traffic drugs. So I was covering Nuevo Laredo, and the violence escalated. A man I interviewed, Alejandro Domingos Cuellos, Cuello, became chief of police and was shot dead six hours after he swore into office. I found myself reporting on houses packed with kidnapped victims and shootouts between the federal police and local police. And I realized this was not more of the same gang fights. I was covering a moment of change in history. This was a transformation in the type of violence, as instead of being the gang bangers with shaved heads and tattoos and pistols, you had paramilitary organized crime. Former soldiers with AK-47s, metal helmets, bulletproof vests and radios. And this sea change that started in Nuevo Laredo would sweep across Mexico and destabilize the country. It has led to tens of thousands of disappeared and hundreds of thousands of deaths and in my years in Mexico, more than 150 of our journalist colleagues have been murdered. I found myself covering things I could never have imagined. Mass graves of almost 300 bodies next to family homes. A massacre of 72 migrants. And Mexico's dream of a new democratic era had turned into a bloody nightmare. So I did find myself covering a type of war like the people I'd looked up to. But instead of Che Guevara's, it was Chapo Guzman. Instead of military dictatorships, it was democratic presidents with soldiers carrying out massacres. I met too many of the victims who lived their personal tragedies. A mother in Monterrey, a school teacher who had seen her son, an 18-year-old philosophy student, dragged away by gunmen and was searching for years for him with no closure. I got to the villains, the demons, the drug cartel traffickers, 
the hitmen. But they also have their own stories. And you find the line between good and evil runs through every human heart. And I found heroes. And some of those heroes are in this room, the Mexican journalists who carry on reporting the news despite violence and murder and intimidation. So now we are in 2022 and these are tough times. That dream of democracy and human rights is dying as a global project and it's dying in Mexico. Violence is raging but it lo no longer makes global news because people are used to it. The president in Mexico is constructing a new type of military industrial complex and we have at least 15 journalists killed in Mexico this year alone and there's a new epi ep opioid epidemic in the United States much worse than the one I was growing up with with a hundred thousand dead from overdoses in a single year last year we don't even know what our dreams are anymore but history has cycles, and we will find ourselves at the beginning of new sea changes. This status quo will not last. New dreams will be born, and if we can come back to this room in another 20 years, we can hope it will not be to lament mountains of corpses. It will not be to lament 15 colleagues killed in a single year that would be over, that would be history. Thanks so much to Columbia University. Thanks so much to my family, especially my wife, Miriam, has always supported me. And to our trade, la verdad nos hará libres. Daniel Matamala, please come to the podium. <laughs> Daniel Matamala, Matamala is a remarkable innovator in journalism who has managed to juggle platforms including print, broadcast, and digital while also maintaining the highest quality of investigative journalism. Through the prism of economics, Matamala takes on business and political elites from Chile to Venezuela to the U.S.-Mexico border. But he also shows a compassionate repertorial eye for those at the bottom of the economic ladder who suffer most at the hands of the powerful. He has primarily worked for television networks in his native Chile as a reporter, interviewer, and host and in important publications in Mexico. In a half dozen books in Spanish and English, Matamala has focused on the way behind the scenes money manipulates politics, war, and even sports. It is rare for a reporter to be able to translate such an impressive command of economics into meaningful stories that go to the roots and the heart of injustice. For his journalistic rigor and innovative approach to reporting, the jury is proud to honor Daniel Matamala with the Mariah Morris Cabot Gold Medal. Congratulations, Daniel.
2011 years ago, the ship Galloway set sail from right here in New York, headed for my country, Chile. On board was the first printing press that the nascent country will have. Previously, during colonial rule, the press has been forbidden in Chile. It makes sense. The colonial authorities did not want any new and dangerous ideas to be printed and distributed. When the first Chilean government was created, one of its very first decision was to buy a printing press, the one that came from here, from New York, and use it to create Chile's first newspaper. That paper was called, quite fittingly, La Aurora de Chile. It means the dawn of Chile. And it was directed by Camilo Enriquez, who was born in Valdivia, the same small city in the south of Chile where I am from. My country, my republic were born with the press. And I am convinced that this is a universal fact. No republic, no democracy, can survive without a free and vigorous press. <laughs> Camilo Enriquez once said that making actions public is useful to stimulate good, retract bad, and feed the honor. I think that is true too. Giving the public access to information about how powerful people are using their power is necessary in order to stimulate a good government and to protect citizens from abuses of power, both political and economic. And this is exactly why those who want to abuse their power view independent press as the enemy. If they destroy the people's trust in professional journalism, they will have their hands free to abuse, to lie, and ultimately to destroy democracy. In this country, a former president attacked the press as the enemy of the people and has been so successful in his, in his effort that according to a 2018 CBS poll, 91% of his supporters trust in him, a serial liar, as a source of accurate information only 11% of them trust mainstream media. Once in a conversation with journalist Leslie Stahl, he even explained his strategy outright, saying that he continually hammers the media, quote, to discredit you all and demean you all. So when you write negative stories about me, no one will believe you. His example and his methods have been followed by authoritarian leaders from government or from opposition parties in Mexico, El Salvador, Venezuela, Brazil, Chile, and many other countries. The receipt is the same, intimidation, coercion, threats, and attacks using social media. The target, independent and critical journalists. The objective, is to discredit every critical voice and to finally blur any distinction between truth and lies. I want to close with some very current words. The present crisis of Western democracy is a crisis of journalism. This line is so current that it was written 100 years ago by Walter Lippmann, in his book, Liberty and the News. When we think about the many parallels between today's crisis of democracy and the rise of fascism one century ago, we should remember that that was a time of crisis for journalism, too. A crisis that was useful to later reform journalism and to advance to a more professional and trustworthy media environment. Today, just as a century ago and two centuries ago, our republics still need a press. They need strong, independent journalism. When this journalism or its credibility is destroyed, the destruction of the republic is only a matter of time. 
just a few words to, to close. I want to say thank you to everybody in the Cabot Prizes and the Columbia University. Uh, thank you very much to my team in Chilevisión that work hard every day to deliver independent journalism, to my colleagues and former colleagues in CNN Chile, Radio Sonar, Canal 13, La Tercera, CIPER. Thank you to my good friends and great journalists, Francisca Skognich, Monica Gonzalez, Andrea Insunza. Thank you to my mom, Te Quiero Mamá. Um, <laughs> Gracias a Eloy y Marina, que son la luz de mi vida. Viva la prensa libre, viva el periodismo independiente, viva Chile. And now we'll watch a short video about the 2021 Cabot Prize winners. Eliane Broom literally moved from the southern Brazil to a city in the heart of the Amazon. Eliane's columns are, are, are often poignant and, and emotional. You can literally cry uh, reading some of her heartbreaking descriptions and stories that, that she goes with a lot of, of empathy and investigate on the ground. One of the things that makes Adela's job especially difficult is there is no one to back her. She's equally unpopular with the cartels as she is with the state government and sometimes the national government. And Adela hasn't backed down. Her team has not backed down. The tradition of SEPA of naming and showing people what is happening continues. And she epitomizes that wonderful phrase, nevertheless, she persisted. She's not someone to follow the pack, but someone to tell stories in a dispassionate way, but that helps readers make up their own minds about how to feel about what's happening in these countries. It's a really complicated matter, and only somebody who knows the region, the people, the culture, the language, can do that level of work. But I think that she cares deeply about getting it right, and she cares deeply about holding powers accountable, and this is her life's work. She gets very close to people who are in the most extreme circumstances of poverty and distress. I think of the work that she did with the mothers of the Zika babies in Brazil, whose babies were doomed by a disease to lives of pain and disability, and yet Adriana captured the absolute love and commitment that these mothers had to these children. Her work is really extraordinary to the degree that it really brings you right to these uh, people in distress and gives them their full measure of humanity. Regina Martinez is a paradoxical figure. Her nickname was Shorty, and boy was she tall, and boy did she leave a long shadow. The cartels warned her, told her she would be killed, and it didn't matter to her. She followed through on a story in one of the most violent places in Mexico, in Veracruz. The cartels, or someone, followed through and killed her. And they thought by doing that, they would silence her. 12 years after her death, her memory her persistence, her ability to uncover extreme cartel violence and government complicity on it lives on in the form of the cartel project. It's ironic that uh, La Chaparrita, the little one, has now become a, uh, a gigantic figure. These two young women, Jennifer Avila and Katy Calderon, created this extraordinary website and they 
uh, practice very high quality journalism. They do investigative journalism. They do reports on government policy. They've done that under more or less continuous threat from the authorities. And at the same time, they have taken it on themselves to train a new generation of journalists in Honduras. Please welcome the 2021 Cabot winners here with us as they come to the podium. Adela Navarro Bello, Eliane Broom, Mary Beth Sheridan, and Jennifer Avila. Now for our final honoree of the evening, our special citation winner, Javier Gaza Ramos, please come to the podium. For more than 25 years, Javier Gaza Ramos has been a journalist committed to serving and informing his community under the most extreme circumstances while also dedicating himself to journalist safety in Mexico and elsewhere. Having experienced firsthand violent attacks in Mexico as an editorial director of El Siglo, Garza Ramos established safety protocols that reporters and editors started to follow when covering violence or being at risk. Those protocols were soon replicated in other newsrooms <clears throat> in Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, Costa Rica, Colombia, Ecuador, Chile, and the United States. After he left El Siglo, he continued to be an advocate for freedom of the press and the protection of reporters in Mexico and beyond. As Ramos started new journalistic projects and highlighted the importance of local news. In these difficult times, when independent journalism is under attack in Mexico and many other countries in the Americas, the Cabot jury honors Javier, Javier Garza Ramos with the 2022 Mariah Moore's Cabot Special Citation as an enduring example of intrepid reporting and for his commitment to his colleagues in the face of adversity. Congratulations, Hubbard. Really, really Uh, thank you, President Baldinger and Dean Cobb. I, I didn't know we were the last and the first, so the first shall be the last. Thank you to the Cabot family. Thank you to the jury. I am really honored to be here with this uh, group of journalists, the 2022, the 21, and 20. Uh, people who I have admired for their prose, their creativity, their insights, and their courage. I read somewhere, I don't know if you've heard this, that there is an old saying in Boston, that the Cabots talk only to God, so this must feel really special. Journalism is often the work of the unexpected. When I took over the newsroom of El Siglo de Torreón a decade and a half ago, I had no way of knowing we were on the verge of the most violent period in modern Mexican history, 
and the beginning of the deadliest streak for journalists in our country. Organized crime was showing its bloody claws and drug cartels were beginning a turf war for control in my city in northern Mexico. We learned that one of the first things drug cartels did when they tried to take over a territory was to pay close attention to how the violence they unleashed was covered in the media. They had this crazy notion that people were in panic, not because of the shootouts or the dead bodies that they were dumping in the streets, but the fact that they were showing up in the newspapers. As the violence grew, so did our coverage and so did the threats and armed attacks. At the newsroom, we decided that since no authority would protect us, we had to protect ourselves because we could not abandon this story, the most important story of our generation. Self-censorship was not an option, even if it was an impulse. We began to build safety protocols for reporters covering crime in the streets, for editors deciding how those stories would be published. We slowly put the pieces together from how to approach a crime scene to deciding what kind of pictures to run and avoid amplifying the violence. If it bleeds, it leads was no longer a motto. It was a risk that we, put, that we could be mouthpieces to criminals as their forms of violence became a form of message. It was a process of trial and error, slowly putting pieces together. Sometimes I felt like that memorable line in Citizen Kane, when Kane tells Mr. Thatcher, I don't know how to run a newspaper, I just try everything I can think of. We tried everything we could think of. But as colleagues began to ask us to share these protocols with them, we knew we were in the right track. And yes, sometimes we even had to bend some ethical rules in journalism because when lives are at stake, the moral calculation is different. And we learned a few things along the way. We learned about the importance of trust in your newsroom. We learned all, all the ways violence was affecting the pulse and life of our city. We learned about empathy and trauma Although I must confess, I never understood that as fully as I did here at Columbia with the Ogbur Fellowship. For me, the hardest part was realizing that a decision that I made could cause a reporter to be kidnapped or our offices attacked, and it happened more than once. The worst case scenario, that a decision I made could get a reporter killed, fortunately never happened to me, but it has happened to others. As journalism pay the ultimate price, it happened, for example, to someone who stood here 11 years ago and someone whose memory we honor today, Javier Valdez, who was, <laughs> who was killed. And even the death of a, such a high profile journalist did not push authorities to end the wake of violence. If anything, it has gotten worse involving both organized crime and public officials, gangs and security forces. Sadly, we have learned that impunity is the fuel for violence against journalists. Each attack happens because the, lab, the last one goes unpunished. I have no desire to suffer twice in reality and in retrospect, Sophocles writes in Oedipus Rex. In a sense, that is the story of journalists in Mexico attacked first and then again by being ignored by those who must uphold the rule of law. But as this price has consistently shown, we are not alone. Each time a recognition like the Cabot goes to a Mexican journalist, like Laura today, Adela last year, or Marcela Turati, or our colleagues at Rio 12 or El Diario de Juarez, we have felt it like as our own. There are so many people to thank for who showed us we are not alone. I will mention some who are present here in their own way. Rosenthal Alves, to whom dozens of journalists in Latin America have looked up to as a fierce advocate of press freedom. And for me, his guidance and mentorship of 20 years has been invaluable. Present in their own way, Present in their own way because there is also someone who, even though he left us almost a decade ago, somehow still watches us here today. 
I still remember his phone calls two or three times a month just to chat, or three or four times a day during a crisis. As the best reminder that others were willing to help us, he was Mike O'Connor of the CPJ, who along with Carlos Lauria, who uh, here present as well, were always keeping an eye out for us. And of course, my reason for being here, my parents who taught me to take on every challenge and get the job done, and the family I formed as violence was engulfing our town and my profession. My wife, Catalina, who walked this path with me, and our daughters, and our daughters, Amelia and Elena, who were born in the middle of this journey and pushed me to keep going. Thank you. Congratulations to all of tonight's winners. Now I would like to invite all the Cabot Prize winners to come back here to this stage at one last time. Please come to the stage and thank you very much to all of you and good night.